Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to session number eight. This session I'm going to be uh, discussing the uh, post-World War II operation of the national security state. This has been a major avenue for the growth of government in American history, uh, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Uh, right now, here in 2003, we've entered into one of the spurts, and uh, it looks as if it's going to continue at least for another year or two, perhaps more, we shall see. During uh, World War II, the United States built up a tremendous uh, military-industrial complex. It wasn't known as that at the time, but uh, after that turn of phrase came into general use in 1961, when President Eisenhower used it in his final speech, uh, many people were able to look back and see that uh, that's exactly what it was, <clears throat> and, and indeed it was, uh, by many measures, the biggest military-industrial complex that ever existed in American history. Uh, we, we saw earlier today that, that some 40% of measured gross domestic product was being devoted to military purposes uh, for some three years running during World War II. And uh, the post-war military economy never consumed uh, uh, that many resources, either relative to uh, overall output in the economy or, or even in absolute terms. Uh, World War II was such a big deal that uh, even in retrospect, it's still bigger than anything uh, since then. Uh, without even comparing it to the economy or anything else. It was just a gigantic undertaking involving uh, scores of millions of people in one capacity or another. Now, when the war ended, uh, the United States found itself in a, in a position it had never before occupied in the world. Uh, the U.S. economy had been... Uh, the biggest in the world for a long time. It became the biggest uh, in the 19th century uh, in terms of the value of its output. But uh, even though the United States was a, a great uh, industrial power, if you want to call it that, uh, the United States did not channel that economic potential into military purposes uh, except uh, during World War I, and then only very briefly. Uh, after World War I, the military uh, forces that had been built up for the war were, were largely uh, dismantled. Uh, the army, which had four million uh, people in 1918, was reduced back to a couple hundred thousand. Uh, and uh, during the interwar period, the military uh, uh, typically received less than 1% of gross domestic product for its support. So it was, it was not non-existent, but it was a, a very trifling uh, military uh, organization, uh, even in absolute terms, and certainly compared to the military forces of the major European countries or Japan. So... Uh, during World War II, when the United States became such a, a, a gigantic military power in, in every way, uh, our Navy was built up enormously. It roamed the Earth's oceans. Uh, it had outpaced the British Navy by far during that time. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, United States Air Force had been developed with the long-range bombing capacities and bases scattered around the world. Uh, the technology had been developed uh, up to and including uh, atom bombs, which only the United States possessed at that time. So in, in 1945, um, the United States was 
uh, in many respects, the world's military superpower. And that was a completely new situation uh, for this country. Uh, and not one that everybody welcomed, but uh, in, in a sense, one that many people uh, viewed as a, as a kind of fate or destiny that had to be dealt with uh, rather than uh, walked away from. And the reason, of course, they, they felt uh, the United States should not simply dismantle its armed forces as, as it always had in the past after engagement in a uh, major war uh, was because of the situation in, in Europe and Asia. As I said earlier, uh, in many respects, the Soviet Union was the true victor of World War II, and uh, at the end of the war, it found itself in the possession of, of uh, a big part of uh, Europe, uh, stretching way out into uh, what was then Czechoslovakia, uh, in penetrating deeply into Western Europe and uh, occupying part of, of Germany and Poland and all of those Eastern European countries that became its satellites. And uh, even though the United States and uh, the Soviet Union had been allied in fighting Germany, uh, I think it would be wrong to say that, uh, that Americans in general ever fully embraced <laughs> the Russians in the same way that they embraced, say, the our British allies. Uh, there was always lingering distrust. Uh, many people were afraid of communism. And uh, no matter how smiley a face uh, the State Department and the president might paint on Stalin, uh, uh, it, it just didn't work for a lot of people. And they continued to view him uh, as the worst kind of dictator, even though many of them still at that time did not understand what a horrible uh, monster he was, uh, but soon after World War II, many more people became aware of that, and that uh, that only heightened the tension uh, be between uh, America and the Soviet Union. So the the end of World War II merged uh, almost seamlessly uh, into uh, this uh, conflict uh, with the uh, Soviets. And uh, within a few years, State Department officials such as George Kennan were propounding the doctrine of containment as a way of dealing with the Russians and what was taken to be their aggressiveness in the world. Uh, people feared that uh, they had such a powerful military apparatus that they might simply overrun other parts of the world as they had overrun Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, there was no doubt uh, that they did have an enormously powerful military machine in 1945. Uh, we can say everything we want about uh, the bungling Russians, uh, but the, the truth is, although they got some aid from the United States in Lend-Lease assistance, uh, for the most part, it was their own resources and ingenuity and blood that went into defeating the Wehrmacht. Uh, World War II, although most Americans don't appreciate it, was fought almost entirely on the, on the Russian front, not on the Western front. I mean, there was hardly any fighting there at all until the last year of the war, and the uh, fighting in the Mediterranean was a trifling affair by comparison with what was going on in Russia. So the Russians paid the price, and they ultimately triumphed. They defeated the Germans. Uh, so I, I am not one of those who's inclined to just dismiss them and say it was a bogeyman, uh, the idea that uh, the world had anything to fear from the Soviets was just a, a creation of people who, for their own purposes, sought to, to have a Cold War. Now, of course, the fact that the Russians had a powerful military machine and, uh, and an evil government uh, those facts in themselves do not necessarily imply that they had aggressive designs or really a hope to overrun France or uh, go any further than they had already gone. Uh, those issues are more arguable ones. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I, I just want to make clear that I'm not among those who, who, who blame the Cold War entirely on, uh, on Americans. Uh, I think there was another side uh, involved, and uh, there were some, you know, some extremely evil people on that side. Uh, the more one reads about the history of the Soviet Union, the, the more disgusted one becomes. It was, it was exactly what Reagan called it, an evil empire in, in every sense of the word. But whatever might, might have been the reality, the, the view of decision makers in the U.S. government in the Truman administration quickly became one uh, uh, that favored uh, stout resistance to uh, Soviet expansion. And uh, Truman himself took readily to that view. Now, uh, the general public did not take quite so readily to it, uh, particularly uh, to the, uh, the, the idea that uh, huge amounts of money should be spent on the American military apparatus in order to provide the the reality of resistance and the, the punch for uh, an effective containment policy. After all, Americans had just finished uh, paying enormous amounts to fight World War II, and uh, they weren't exactly in, in the mood to keep, keep coughing up those kinds of resources indefinitely as of 1946 and 1947. Furthermore, uh, these threats were far away uh, they were not so easily uh, represented as, as uh, immediate threats as, as Hitler had, had been, or, or the Japanese after they let loose their bombs on Hawaii. So it was a harder sell uh, for the government to persuade the general public uh, that we needed to launch back into a big military program. Uh, even though uh, leaders of the Truman administration decided fairly early that that's what they would like to do. Uh, uh, nonetheless, there was continuing resistance, particularly by the public's representatives in Congress. Uh, when the administration proposed to increase the military budget, there was tremendous opposition in Congress. And on one occasion, when the president was discussing this situation with Senator Vandenberg, who, who by that time had uh, transformed himself, he was no longer an isolationist as a result of the experience of World War II and the post-war situation, uh, and uh, had become something of an early Cold Warrior in his own right, uh, Vandenberg advised to Truman that uh, what, what was necessary was, in his words, to scare hell out of the American public. Uh, and I think that was good political advice. Uh, indeed, that, that sort of scare uh, works wonders, at least for a while, in the American political process. So uh, even in the late 40s, the government of the United States was uh, working to represent the Soviet threat as, as really more menacing than, uh, in retrospect, it, it appears to have been. Uh, they were uh, releasing information about the number of Soviet divisions, for example, that, uh, that, that counted uh, divisions of the Red Army that were, that were not uh, fully equipped or manned or were not... Uh, uh, we're not in active status, and so forth. So it made it seem that the, that the legions of potential Red Army uh, personnel were in, endless, uh, and the only way to uh, keep them from overrunning Western Europe was by an enormous defensive effort. There's a, um, an essay I want to recommend to you uh, that deals with uh, this time and place by Ralph Rako. Uh, it appears in the, the book Reassessing the Presidency, which is edited by John Denson and published by the Mises Institute. And uh, if you haven't read uh, Rako's essay on the Truman administration, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's excellent. It's a as like everything uh, Ralph writes, it's it's beautifully written. It's uh, well documented, and it pulls together in a single essay more uh, 
pertinent information and argument uh, with regard to the Truman administration than I've ever seen in one small space before. So one can learn a lot from uh, that single essay by Rako, and I hope you will read it if you haven't done so already. As part of the uh, reorganization uh, of the American defense apparatus after World War II, uh, in order to, in one sense, uh, put into effect what had been learned during the war, and in another sense, to get ready for future and different conditions, uh, the military was reorganized. Congress passed a huge piece of legislation in 1947, the National Security Act, uh, which uh, which created uh, the Department of Defense uh, before we hadn't had any single government agency. Uh, we had uh, a separate war department and a, and a Navy department. Uh, and now, uh, not only uh, the Army and Navy, but but uh, another military department, which was was created at the same time, the Air Force was brought underneath the Department of Defense, and the Secretary of Defense became, from that time forward, uh, if not the most important uh, member of the cabinet, certainly one of the two or three most important in every administration. Besides the Department of Defense, uh, for the civilian part of the war machine, the, uh, the act created the National Security Council uh, composed of high-ranking government officials uh, and uh, in possession of its own permanent staff so that uh, these people could concentrate on and inform themselves with regard to issues bearing on national security, and then they would be the principal advisors to the president with regard to national security matters. So this became a very important uh, part of the executive uh, office of the president and, and remains so today. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency was created at that time uh, to uh, replace the old OSS, the Office of Strategic Services that had uh, provided uh, intelligence uh, uh, organization during World War II. And the uh, director of Central Intelligence was made the person uh, responsible for bringing together all the intelligence uh, that might be acquired not only by the CIA itself, but by any other government intelligence department, including those of the military services. Uh, so we had, uh, from 1947 on, this arrangement of, of uh, national security uh, affairs in the government that has operated ever since then. So this whole setup is, uh, is now 56 years old, and uh, we, uh, we've had a good chance to see what it can do, and that's what I'm going to talk about. The um, events of the late 1940s uh, helped to solidify uh, what we can now see is the onset of the Cold War. Historians uh, find it pleasant to argue endlessly about exactly when the Cold War began. It can't be dated in the same way as uh, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. <laughs> That's pretty definite timing. Uh, but uh, as I said, there was always some tension between the United States and the Soviet Union even before the end of World War II. Uh, but that tension really uh, became much greater after the war ended. Uh, Soviet troops were occupying uh, northern Iran at the end of the war, and the U.S. government decided, well, they shouldn't be there. That was a kind of expansionism that shouldn't be tolerated because it, wh where were they going to go next? If they had moved into Iran, then perhaps the next thing you know, they'd be at the Indian Ocean. So... Uh, uh, that was protested. Uh, they, they seemed to be acting as if they were trying to somehow gain uh, control of the Dardanelles, uh, which is an important uh, chokehold on commerce in the eastern Mediterranean. So the U.S. government protested uh, those Soviet moves. Uh, 
Communist insurgents were operating actively in Greece at that time, and the U.S. government decided that that wouldn't do either to have the Greek government go communist. After all, we already had this, this huge area of Central and Eastern Europe under Soviet control, so a line should be drawn at the border of Greece, and so uh, they did draw that line, and, and they, in connection with Greece in particular, uh, propounded what came to be known as the Truman Doctrine. And that was the doctrine that when existing governments were menaced with communist takeover, the United States would, in one way or another, go to their assistance. Now, one has to do very little thinking to realize that this kind of commitment was simultaneously a commitment to prop up a lot of really vile governments around the world. <laughs> because many of the governments that were under attack to some extent by communists or people who could be labeled as communists, even though they might be just unhappy peasants out in the local jungle, uh, a lot of those governments were, were in no other regard uh, governments Americans would care to support. In fact, uh, they, they, were, they were eminently uh, loathable <laughs> in many cases. Uh, and yet, a uh, commitment to aid anyone resisting communism put the United States in this position of drawing lines according to that one criterion. And uh, over the years, uh, uh, the operation of foreign policy in accordance with that doctrine uh, had countless uh, unfortunate consequences. It, uh, it, it, for example, led the United States to, to, to overthrow the government of, of Iran in the early 50s and, and to bring in and support the, the Shah and to, and to support a really tyrannical government in Iran uh, and to make a lot of Iranians profoundly unhappy, not just against the Shah's government, but against the United States for supporting it. And uh, we're still living today with the unfortunate consequences of that particular uh, implementation of the Truman Doctrine. Uh, but it had similarly uh, unfortunate consequences all around the world, uh, in, in, including the U.S. Uh, support for anti-communist or alleged anti-communist uh, forces in Vietnam. Uh, which uh, eventually led to uh, U.S. involvement in full-scale warfare there and got uh, several million people killed in the process. So th this was a doctrine that was, uh, we might think in retrospect, too readily arrived at. <laughs> uh, it might have been one thing to say, all right, let's go help the Greeks and keep Greece from being taken over by communists, but uh, by, by making this a kind of general rule for the conduct of U.S. foreign policy, uh, the, the uh, country was put in a, uh, a straitjacket that uh, didn't always serve its best interests. In 1948, uh, these tensions with the Soviets reached the point where the Soviets decided that they would exercise uh, their their chokehold over access to Berlin, uh, which uh, had the curious position of ha being contained entirely within the Soviet sector of occupation in Germany. So it was a little island uh, in their sector, but itself divided into sectors among the occupation powers. So it made no sense strategically to have ever made it that way to begin with, and it, it, it was tailor-made for the Russians to use to blackmail uh, the Americans, and, and so they, they did that by closing off uh, land access to the city in 1948. And uh, the United States, of course, rather than just letting the, the city go and saying, all right, it's not worth uh, fighting over, and it's not worth... Uh, worrying about in some other respect, it's in your sector, it's yours, uh, decided to keep the non-Soviet sectors of the city alive with an airlift. And uh, with the aircraft of that day, this was a monumental undertaking because they didn't really carry all that much cargo. <laughs> and so we had all of these uh, 
these uh, small cargo aircraft flying uh, 24 hours a day, uh, flying from uh, West Germany uh, to deliver supplies to keep alive the people of West Berlin until finally the Soviets decided that they didn't want to go to war over this either, and it really wasn't working. Their, their chokehold wasn't uh, causing the Americans to give up control of Berlin uh, in their, their sector, so, uh, so they relented. Uh, but uh, that whole Berlin closure and airlift episode was like verging on war between the Soviet Union and the United States because embargoes, which this seemed to be a species of, are themselves acts of war. Uh, uh, and then the very next year, 1949, uh, the Chinese forces in China, finally, after decades of fighting, uh, drove their opponents off of the mainland onto refuge in Formosa. And uh, that became known here as the, the Fall of China, or uh, if you were one of the Fall Guys, uh, the loss of China, for which certain American diplomats were blamed. Uh, supposedly, uh, if, if the United States had, had acted differently, or perhaps had given more military support to the nationalist forces, then the Chinese would not have won. Uh, I think that quite unlikely myself, but, uh, but this, of course, became a, a kind of litmus test for conservatives uh, as opposed to uh, Truman liberals for a long time in this country, uh, recriminations over and finger-pointing and blaming people for the fall of China. I actually blame Gordon Tullock uh, myself, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not as much fun to do that when Gordon's not in the audience. Uh, <laughs> Gordon likes to talk about when he was in the, the foreign service in China before the uh, the communist victory there. So he makes a good patsy in my mind. Uh, also in 1949, uh, the the whole tenor of the conflict with the Soviet Union changed when the Soviets uh, tested an atomic bomb. For, for, for four years after the end of the war, the United States had felt itself to be holding a trump card. Right? The Soviets had all of these divisions of the Red Army and these tens of thousands of tanks and so forth, but we had atomic bombs and uh, the kinds of aircraft that could deliver them over very long distances. So we always felt that if worst came to worst, uh, we had what it would take to defeat them. Uh, and, and, and now, in 1949, we realized that, oops, <laughs> we never thought they could nearly so quickly find their way to the development of a working atom bomb. But, uh, but they had, uh, in part because uh, while they were carrying off factories from from East Germany, they were also carrying off German scientists <laughs> who were instrumental in, in hastening their production of uh, uh, nuclear weapons. So that, that changed things and, and, and made tensions even greater than they had been. Uh, and then uh, the North Koreans uh, began their invasion in the middle of 1950 of South Korea and almost drove uh, American forces uh, who, who went to the assistance of the South Koreans into the ocean uh, before a successful counterattack was made. Uh, and, and then, of course, that was too successful because MacArthur drove all the way almost to the Chinese border, thereby provoking the Chinese to come across the border and uh, counterattack the counterattack. So the, the, the outcome in Korea was a stalemate after a considerable loss of life on all sides, uh, and that stalemate has persisted to the very present. And once again, we have a situation here that is, that is extremely germane to foreign policy today. We've now got this situation with these North Koreans claiming to have atomic weapons. 
And uh, whether they do or not, they certainly have a gigantic conventional capacity right on the border, close enough that they can use artillery to blow soul to smithereens. Uh, and we know they can do that, whether they have any atomic bombs or not. So, so this is a very serious uh, uh, gang of thugs armed and positioned in, in a way that makes them uh, capable of uh, of considerable blackmail, and uh, of course that that's clearly what they're trying to do: is simply extract various concessions and resources, in exchange for relenting in these threats to to wreak havoc uh, against uh, South Korea in particular, and perhaps against uh, Japan as well. So. The events of the past 55 years, uh, as it were, uh, in many cases just retain life. They never just happen and pass away. Uh, situations uh, continue to burn even if the embers don't seem to be very red. They may burst into flame again from time to time. Well, we can look back and say definitely the Korean War uh, got the Cold War started, for sure, even if we don't think it had already begun. Uh, and many people would think the, that war was certainly an unfortunate thing. But not Dean Acheson. Uh, Acheson wrote in his memoirs, uh, Korea saved us. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, uh, Remember, the Truman administration had been committed for years to a military buildup for the purpose of global containment of the Soviet Union and its proxies. But it had been unable to get Congress to approve the money. <laughs> well, with the outbreak of the Korean War and uh, the intervention of large numbers of American military forces on the Korean Peninsula, the government could then go to Congress and get agreement for tremendous buildup of the military. And it's very easy to look back at the graphs and see this big jump up in military spending and associate that with the Korean War. But in a way, it's a spurious association. It's politically associated with the Korean War but the great bulk of that buildup was not ever intended or ever directed toward anything connected with the Korean War. <laughs> it was for the purpose of uh, building and equipping forces in other parts of the world, in Europe and, and in other parts of Asia especially. So uh, what Atchison meant was uh, we were, were getting nowhere in getting Congress to give us the money for a big military buildup to wage the Cold War, but Korea saved us. And very often we, we'll see uh, over the past 50 years some such crisis, some such flashpoint saves the government's whole military undertaking. Uh, this one worked like a charm. So we can view Korea as the fulcrum that turns us fully on to a Cold War status. Now, the Cold War was what we used to think of as a permanent war. I mean, all my life, uh, I, I was born during World War II, so for all my life when I had any awareness of what was going on in the world, the Cold War seemed like just the state of nature. It's, all, it's always been there. It'll always be there. Uh, it was hard to imagine there being no Soviet Union or no, no communists out there trying to, as our leaders always said, take over the world. Uh, uh, now, of course, we look back, we see this whole uh, terrible central planning military machine called the USSR. It just went to wreck and ruin. Uh, it's no longer much of a threat to anybody directly, although it's still indirectly a threat because it still has all those nuclear weapons. Uh, 
and uh, people can have accidents or let them fall into the wrong hands, so they're, they're not without some danger. Uh, but the world no longer lives under the cloud of gigantic exchange of uh, nuclear missiles that it lived under for decades during the Cold War. So that's gone. It wasn't a permanent war after all, uh, but it, now, just in the past couple of years, uh, the authorities, having realized what a good deal in many ways the Cold War was, have found a new basis and an even better basis for permanent war, namely the war on terrorism. Because it, whereas the Soviet Union could implode, the threat of terrorism can never go away. The president can always come forth and announce that he knows something that we don't know about a terrorist threat out there. Uh, nowadays, any of us could, if we cared to, actually take ourselves to Russia and hike around almost anywhere we wanted to go and say, well, you know, it doesn't look too bad to me. But we can't hike around the world and say, well, I don't see any terrorists. It's in the nature of terrorists that one doesn't see them, right? They look like normal people. And that's good because anybody could be a terrorist, which means the government has to take measures not only against the whole world, any part of which might be harboring terrorists, but it has to take uh, measures of surveillance and protection against all of us because we might be terrorists or in some way, perhaps even inadvertently, be aiding or abetting terrorists. So uh, what could be better for the conduct of a permanent war? Uh, I worked out a while back a, a little scheme, a, a kind of a mental model, if you like, of what you need if you want to have a permanent war. Now, at the outset, you might think that's a ridiculous concept. Why would anybody want to have a permanent war? So really what I'm thinking of is not a permanent shooting war. I, I don't think very many people want every year to be like 1944. <laughs> That's not in too many people's interest. <laughs> but if you can have permanent preparation for war, especially if that war never actually comes about, that can be a very good situation for many people uh, who play some role in carrying on this permanent war. So what you need, to, if you want to uh, carry on such a, a, a campaign, is first of all a, a, an ideology to justify doing it. Uh, during the Cold War, anti-communism served that purpose. Uh, if we didn't already fear and hate communism, the government was continually exhorting us to do so, and, uh, and most Americans were reared and instinctively came to revile communism. Uh, that was not a bad thing, except that it was embraced so mindlessly. <laughs> it would have been all right if we had all done our homework and discovered who the communists are and what they do and had loathed them accordingly. But that wasn't how we arrived at it. We arrived at it by being told, have these beliefs, and then embracing them. And that's not a good sign when people act like sheep. Se secondly, you, you need to have... Uh, powerful political factions who benefit uh, in terms of the realization of their very specific objectives in life. So if, for example, you want to get business interests involved in an enterprise, there needs to be money in it. Okay? Business needs to make money when it does things. That's what business is for. Uh, if you want to get politicians involved, then you need to give politicians what they want. Uh, which tends to be, for those who hold elective office, things that work toward helping them get reelected. Uh, if you want to get the military organization involved, you need to provide somehow the things military officers want. Pay, perquisites, a big budget for the military organization, lots of opportunities for advancement and recognition of their military prowess, so you promote their careers. Uh, and what we're talking about specifically here is what came to be called the military-industrial complex, uh, 
And I called uh, the military industrial congressional complex because in the United States, uh, by uh, the late 50s and into the 1960s, Congress had uh, awakened to the potential that the military industrial complex held if Congress more actively micromanaged it. By doing so, uh, members of Congress, particularly in the, the uh, appropriation subcommittees that uh, oversaw the military budget and, and the military authorization committees, these people who held strategic positions with regard to Congress's military affairs, uh, could, in fact, design things in a way that targeted benefits to people who would be grateful and then would, in return, uh, see to helping them in various ways with getting votes and money for campaigns. And, and in the good old days, in the 50s and 60s, just a lot of outright uh, income and kind, uh, entertaining them at hunting lodges, providing prostitutes, uh, cash in a plain brown wrapper, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, why do you think I call them the good old days? Uh, <laughs> so uh, Congress began to take a much keener interest, so keen an interest that I think they need to be recognized as a, an important actor in the MIC. And so I add uh, Congress to this uh, whole setup here. I've, I've got a little diagram here to, to uh, add a few details. Notice at the top I've got the public. Uh, because it's easy to start talking as if the whole world's being run by a conspir conspiracy. And, and first of all, it's not a conspiracy. A great deal of what's being done here is being done in a perfectly open way. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of secrecy, like the cash in a plain brown wrapper. But, uh, but most of it is not a conspiracy. It's just a, a coalescence of interests of people who have important roles to play uh, in managing the military affairs of the country. Now, the public is engaged up here because the, they pay the bills for all this, and so they've got to be kept uh, under the influence of the appropriate ideology, and they've got to be given the appropriate information to make them tolerate whatever it is that the, the machine uh, is made to do. Uh, but furthermore, the public gets involved here because many members of the public will actually themselves benefit. Uh, they'll get earnings, they'll get jobs, they'll get uh, profits for their businesses. So it's not just a handful of key players uh, who are, are getting something out of the operation of the MIC. Uh, it, it was actually millions and millions of people for decades on end. So it's not a small political faction. You know, it's not like there being 2,000 sugar farmers who get sugar subsidies. It's more like uh, anywhere from 4 to, to 8, 10 million people at any given time in the Cold War who are, are quite directly tied, and many others indirectly tied. For example, all the people who run retail businesses in areas with a lot of military activity I have a keen interest in keeping those military contracts or those military bases operating at a high rate because it's the people who work there who provide the customers for their businesses. So we've got the public up here, but it's a, it, it's a removed uh, part of uh, the whole uh, scene. And in the complex itself, We've got the D Department of Defense and the regular military departments and the National Guard. We sometimes forget about the Guard, but, uh, but that's a large number of, of people uh, and, and quite a bit of procurement and, and equipment and what have you. And it's especially important where Congress is involved because the National Guard units are the descendants of the militia and they're local people. They, they're your friends and neighbors. And, uh, and uh, you, you can make very uh, tightly focused promises to them if you're a congressman. You can say, I'm, I'm going to insert in the next military budget funds for another C-130 for the local Air Force base. Uh, and in fact, so dependent did the Guard become on these special congressional favors uh, 
that the members of Congress and the military departments entered into thinly veiled conspiracies to make possible these kinds of add-ons. So every year, the, the official Pentagon request doesn't include many items of equipment for the National Guard. But they've already sat down in the back room to decide which member of Congress will add on how many C-130s for which bases where. But of course, the general public doesn't know this. And then the congressman goes forth in his next election campaign, and he says, remember, I worked very hard and was personally responsible for getting additional equipment for the base here. And, uh, and he gets a certain amount of political points with some people for acting in that way. So, so the National Guard is not inconsequential. I've already mentioned Congress and the key committees there. Uh, the defense contractors, of course, uh, some of them do hardly anything but military contracting. They're very specialized in that line of work. And uh, companies like that, indeed, uh, turn out when they try to do other kinds of work to be very bad at it because the kind of skills you need to be a successful, dedicated defense contractor are completely different from the kinds of skills you need to be commercially successful. Somebody like uh, Lockheed, who relies very heavily on military contracts to make money, uh, doesn't have a clue about how to do anything entrepreneurial in a real market, but they know everything about how to find out what the... Uh, Pentagon might be led to want. <laughs> As one of the generals once said, the contractors are where the babies come from. We tend to think, well, the generals sit around and dream up these super weapons, and then they go out and look for contractors. But in fact, it's just the other way around. Uh, Lockheed and Boeing and Martin Marietta are out there full of... Uh, full of evil geniuses in computer science and retired admirals and they're sitting around dreaming up the super weapons of tomorrow. And when they get one in their mind fairly firmly so they can draw a picture of it, then they go give a presentation at the Pentagon and say, gee whiz, wouldn't you like to have something like that? And the generals say, well, golly, that looks, that looks great. You know, can you cook that up? Sure. You know, <laughs> 50 billion and it's yours. So uh, uh, this is how the, uh, the process tends to operate. And as I just suggested, there, there's a revolving door and has been since World War II, whereby high-ranking military officers, when they retire, go directly into employment in defense contracting companies. Uh, thousands and thousands of them have done that. Uh, Low-ranking too, of course, but but the low-ranking ones tend not to affect policy. They just get jobs. But, uh, but you, you, you find thousands of people who were colonels or higher moving in to work for Boeing and, and, and Lockheed and General Dynamics all the time. It happens every year. New ones are brought on board. And, they, and they're not there to tell these manufacturers how to reduce the costs of machining parts. They're there because they know the system and because they know the guys at the Pentagon who are still dealing with procurement. After all, those guys used to work for them. <laughs> so now when they go back to cut a deal with military buyers, they're working with old friends, sometimes old friends of decades long standing, uh, and, and people who used to be under their command in the military. So what could be nicer than that? No wonder General Mullins called this a family affair. It's exactly what it is. The military often thinks of itself as a big family. Yeah, we're just all here on the base together. Uh, so the procurement system is a very much old boy, uh, greased setup. Uh, it, it, it goes through the motions of being a business and it fills out forms and everything, but the reality is quite different. The reality is uh, a lot of schmoozing and a lot of uh, people trading places. Not just officers going into the firms either. Firms, 
giving leave to their highest executives, who then, for a year or sometimes four years, uh, go take up positions in the civilian bureaucracy at the Department of Defense or one of the military departments. So all of these, uh, these guys uh, uh, who, who, who moved to the Pentagon, uh, they're smaller in number than the number of officers who go the other way, but in some ways they're more important uh, because they all go to high-ranking positions. You don't leave Boeing to go work as a flunky in the Department of Defense. You go there as an assistant secretary or so, something of that level. So they go there, they're very important, and once again, now they're working for the government, dealing with people on the business side who used to be their colleagues last month. Uh, so the, the whole system is, is uh, incestuous in the extreme. And the, uh, the, the setup designed to give it the aura of, uh, of bureaucratic uh, punctiliousness is a fraud. Uh, that's all fake. Yeah. Uh, we've got some, uh, some peripheral actors down here I, I just listed for completeness, and we could go on with that list if we wanted to. Universities, think tanks, uh, of course, around uh, Northern Virginia and Maryland, it's the Beltway Bandits are, are thicker than, uh, than fleas on a hound. Uh, and uh, they're all living off defense money uh, channeled to them by the Department of Defense or the, the military departments or one of the intelligence agencies. So, so they're there. Uh, local governments, if they have a base or a big defense plant, uh, they, they get involved. Uh, labor unions, if they have a lot of members working uh, in defense production. Uh, and the veterans and service organizations uh, who are numerous, uh, come into play as cheerleaders uh, and people who can be counted on to always give a kind of general support for enlarging the military budget. Uh, they just instinctively favor that no matter what the situation or no matter how outrageous the proposal. They always say, well, yeah, more money for defense is a good idea. Uh, kind of a faux patriotism comes into play, but, but it's better than that because it's organized. They have conventions, they have lobbyists, they continue to have connections with active military officers who come and you know, give them inside scoop and, and uh, make them feel <laughs> as if they're still involved. Uh, so, uh, so, so they play a role even though it's a, a peripheral role. Okay. Well, this setup has, has been operating now uh, for over half a century. Uh, and along the way, uh, a lot of money was put at its disposal. I, uh, I calculate that uh, since 1948, uh, coming up to the present, if we measure uh, defense spending in current dollars, uh, we're getting into the neighborhood of $17 trillion. That's you know almost two years GDP of the present U.S. economy. That's a, that's an enormous amount of loot. <laughs> I mean, mo most countries in the world GDPs could be swallowed up in there many times over. So this was a a big undertaking, and uh, it's a big undertaking today. If uh, Congress gives the president what he's requested. Uh, for the next fiscal year, uh, the defense budget, you know, the, it will be $400 billion, and, and uh, the merest babe can forecast that it'll actually be more than that, because that's not going to include enough for all the expenses in Iraq and surrounding areas, and they're going to have emergency supplemental appropriations requests, and, and they're going to get them. Okay, because Congress is really a pretty easy touch when it comes to the defense budget whenever there's a crisis. And right now, with the war on terrorism providing the important cover, uh, the administration is in a position to get Congress to approve big infusions. In the late 90s, the fallback of the defense budget uh, was considerable, uh, 
And by the end of the 90s, the defense was consuming only about 3% of GDP. But already, just in the last three years, that's gone back up to 3.5% and rising. So uh, even though the Cold War is over, the permanent war uh, is still going on. Now, I don't know, last night was Dr. Strangelove shown? Uh, it was shown earlier in the week? Okay, well, good. I always recommend that film. It's, uh, it's the greatest film ever made of any kind. And uh, especially in this respect, it's, uh, it's a perfect representation of uh, the situation during what you might call the High Cold War, the 50s, 60s period of a nuclear standoff and... Uh, and there's, there, there's so many things that you can learn from Dr. Strangelove that I, I, I couldn't even begin to list them all. I, uh, I'm still learning from it myself after all these years, and uh, I expect to view it many more times before I die and learn something new every time. So keep watching Dr. Strangelove, and as you do so, you'll understand better and better the world of the high Cold War. Uh, it seems like a kind of other world, a kind of mad uh, world that couldn't really exist. It's just a movie. But the beauty of it is it's not really just a movie at all. It's that far away from reality, just that far. Uh, when Vietnam War uh engaged the United States after 1965. Uh, we had a, another periodic crisis that pumped the defense budget up uh, for three years running, brought it to, uh, up to almost 10% again of GDP by 1968. Uh, after the peak then, it started falling, and uh, there was a long period of, uh, of about a decade during which defense spending fell relative to the economy. And then at the end of the Carter administration, before Reagan took over and set his defense build up in motion, a, a turn had already been made and defense spending was beginning to rise even relative to uh, GDP. Uh, but of course, Reagan uh, accelerated that increase considerably. And during that buildup, defense spending was increased by 50%. So it's, uh, it's very easy to spot on a time series, uh, a big buildup, and, uh, and it's one that we can't associate very easily with any, any specific war or crisis. There was no major, major war connected with its onset, but, but there, there were events that uh, made mighty contributions to giving it a boost at, at the beginning, and, and those were principally the... Soviet invasion of Afghanistan at the end of 1979, and even more important, the hostage taking in Tehran. Uh, I have never in my lifetime seen so many Americans so hysterically angry as I recall them being in 1980. Uh, they felt frustrated. Every night, the television showed these Americans being paraded out blindfolded and pushed around uh, by the hostage takers. And, and Americans watched this night after night after night, and they felt as if their noses were being rubbed in the dirt uh, by people, and they weren't doing anything about it. And uh, many of them became extremely angry and, and, and wanted to lash out. And uh, as the saying goes, nuke the bastards. Uh, and uh, I have no doubt that many would have been quite happy had America <laughs> chosen to drop atomic bombs on uh, the Iranians in 1980. But uh, s s cooler heads prevailed, and eventually, of course, that crisis was resolved. But meanwhile, the defense buildup had been given a huge boost, uh, and uh, even though the public uh, lost faith after a couple of years in the buildup, the Reagan administration was so relentlessly dedicated to it that it managed to keep it going for years after the public uh, had stopped uh, favoring it very much. 
Here we've got defense spending in, in constant dollars from 1940 to the early 1990s, and then I've added a few points later to show you what, what happened subsequently. But, uh, uh, but you'll notice that there's a, there's a kind of a classic Cold War plateau, uh, which in this, uh, in, in this level of purchasing power, $1991, tended to run uh, close to 300 billion a year. And then around that level Cold War trend, we have these deviations associated with the Korean War. There you see the big buildup, and then it only comes back a little bit because now we've got the real Cold War going. It stays this way, and uh, here's Dr. Strangelove right here. Uh, and then we've got Vietnam, uh, the fall back to the late 70s, the Reagan buildup, and then we've got this fallback in the 90s. Uh, but, but now we've begun, I don't show it here, but we've begun another turnaround. And uh, just in the past four fiscal years, uh, spending has increased by uh, more than a third in real terms. So we're off and running for another buildup right now. Here we see how many people were getting a job from this activity. Uh, in terms of millions of persons, uh, the dark part is military personnel. The next section is Department of Defense civilians, and then on top, the defense industry workers. So you can see that altogether during the classic Cold War, we tended to employ maybe six to seven million people, somewhat fewer here, closer to five or six million in the 70s and 80s, uh, although it, it got close to the old totals by the end of the Reagan buildup. So this is a big chunk of uh, the work that's getting done in the United States over half a century. Now, we did see some changes in the political complexion of the Cold War starting in 1968, and they took place very suddenly. What I'm showing on this chart is a measure I constructed myself by using uh, public opinion survey data uh, for many years, going all, all the way back to the late 1940s, Gallup and Roper and these other survey organizations would often ask people when they were making surveys, do you think uh, the U.S. should spend more for defense or less for defense or about the same as now? And that question in almost identical form was asked again and again and again. I found uh, altogether 193 surveys, uh, which were national, which asked that question in almost identical form, and which lacked any cues. They didn't have any introductory phrases about, you know, in view of the Soviet menace or anything that might have biased the respondents toward an answer. And I took all of those data, and uh, in any given year, I just averaged all the different ones in a simple fashion, if I had several. And uh, by the 70s and 80s, every year had a number of such surveys available, so those data are, are more solid. Uh, but uh, whatever I had, I created a, a variable called the opinion balance. I simply took the percentage of people favoring more defense spending and subtracted the percentage favoring less. Now, if people favored the same as now, or if they expressed no opinion, they're not playing a role here in this variable. Uh, the number in, in that third category I call the residuum. And in my statistical work, I actually use that measure of residuum because it actually is a kind of measure of the inertia uh, in the expression of public opinion. Uh, if there's a big residuum, then you would not expect any given opinion balance to have much political import compared to if almost everybody has an opinion, uh, then the balance has more punch. Uh, 
But uh, just uh, uh, from what I've shown here, the, the opinion balance itself, you can see that up until 1968, every time that question was asked, the balance was always, to some extent, positive. Always a greater percentage of respondents said more defense spending than said less. Unbalanced opinion balance. Uh, in some years, uh, crisis years, like here is 1961, and there was a, a, a transitory Berlin crisis that year. And that clearly led a lot of people to favor an increase in defense spending. At the beginning of the Vietnam War, you'll see here in 1965, 66, 67, that balance remained positive. In fact, there was quite a lot of support for the American involvement in the Vietnam War in those first three years. It was just a few college professors and hippies, you know, and Bob Higgs, who, who were opposing the war. But the mass of Americans thought, yeah, they say it's a good idea. President Johnson says we've got to resist communist aggression in Vietnam, so okay, let's do it. Now, what happened is, uh, is, first of all, as casualties began to mount, people, of course, began to lose their enthusiasm for what was happening there. Uh, there's a wonderful book by John Mueller uh, called War and Public Opinion, in which he tracks what happens to public opinion as casualties change in the course of war. And uh, when you look at both the Korean War and the war in Vietnam, it turns out that every time casualties increase by a factor of 10, the public opinion favoring the war drops by 10 percentage points. <laughs> and it's the same statistical relationship in both wars, interestingly. Even though in Korea we didn't have street demonstrations and so forth, we still had growing opposition to the war. People were just expressing it more privately. How much did it drop for every... 10 percentage points. So, so what happened here was that already the, uh, the support for the war, and, and in this case support for military spending, a kind of proxy uh, closely uh, related to that support, uh, is down to a low level in 1967 already. But then it takes a precipitous drop. It's the, 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 one of the biggest drops ever measured in public opinion surveys in 1968. And, and the reason for that was that the Tet Offensive at the beginning of the year uh, made people realize that they'd been lied to all along, that the government had consistently been telling the public that we were winning, it was just a matter of a little more time before we had eliminated all these, uh, you know, handful of guerrillas in the jungle. Uh, we had them on the run. We controlled all the cities. And then suddenly, there they are. They're running around in all the cities killing Americans. I mean, right in the middle of things in Saigon. And, uh, and the public said, wait a minute. <laughs> we, we, we've been led down a path here. Uh, you've tricked us. And support for the war collapsed among the general public. And when it collapsed among the general public, then the politicians began to, to bail out. Uh, first of all, some members of Johnson's uh, cabinet and uh, advisors to the Johnson administration decided that it was a losing proposition, uh, that they should terminate it. Uh, and uh, the president himself realized that in the circumstances, he could not be reelected. Uh, he had reached the point where he couldn't even travel around the country because everywhere he went, uh, so many protesters turned out and, uh, and he feared for his life that somebody would kill him. Uh, so he, he cowered in his quarters and wasn't even able to make public appearances. Uh, so Johnson dropped out, and Nixon uh, was elected, promising that he had a secret plan to end the war. Well, it was very secret. It's so secret that it, uh, that it took five years to be carried out. But, uh, but at least uh, Nixon did, uh, I guess, uh, begin the turnaround of 
diminishing the extent of the military engagement there. It, uh, it's just that he wasn't prepared to just walk away from it. Yes? I uh, saw some historical film footage where Nixon uh, basically admitted that there was never any plan at all. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's true, that the, the expression, we've got a secret plan, was, was baloney. <laughs> but uh, uh, but they, they, they certainly did a lot of diplomatic scheming, and Henry Kissinger was a very busy boy for years uh, working on this, uh, but, uh, but it did take years before they arrived at this Paris Peace Agreement. Now, when, when public opinion collapsed, it had an effect. Uh, what, what I show you here is a, a <clears throat> on the top, that same public opinion balance I was measuring with the bar chart in the previous display. But below it here, I'm measuring on this left-hand scale the rate of change of defense spending. And uh, as you see, uh, there, there is a, a very close association in the two profiles. Their movements are very closely connected. And I, I did a variety of econometric tests to find out what was leading what and to work in controls for the uh, opinion residuum and, uh, and, and to check all kinds of functional forms and so forth. So I, so I, I rang the econometric changes on this baby. Uh, and I'm satisfied that what was happening here was that uh, with some lags, uh, changes in public opinion were, were being followed by changes in the rate, rate of growth of defense spending. Now, the, uh, the easy way to interpret this would be to say, wow, public opinion is just as powerful as David Hume said. <laughs> yeah, public opinion is decisive in the end when, uh, when people uh, decided they wanted less defense spending than defense spending began to diminish, at least in its rate of growth, and actually became uh, negative in its rate of growth. Here's a zero line here, so by the time we get in, in some portions here, we're not really growing at all, to any significant extent at least. But uh, uh, it's not that simple. And it's not that simple because public opinion uh, is not simply what the econometricians call an exogenous variable. It's not something that's just determined out there in the world somewhere and then brought to bear on the political process. And certainly when we talk about the operation of the MIC, we have to recognize that everybody from the president and his National Security Council down through these vested interests uh, of the MIC itself are actively engaged at all times in attempting to determine what public opinion will be, to shape people's beliefs and preferences about national security affairs. And so uh, it's even possible that the very public opinion to which the military apparatus seems to be responding has been created in the first instance by that very military machine. Now, uh, I don't want to suggest that that's quite it either, because if you, if you look at what happened, there are periods, such as after 1968 for a decade, and there are periods in the 1990s when indeed there are substantial reductions uh, in uh, the resources being devoted to military purposes. And I think it's fair to presume that those were not desired by the members of the MIC, and sometimes not even desired by the president and his, and his chief ministers either. And yet, uh, they were forced upon people. So uh, I, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that these people pull all the strings, but only reminding us that public opinion is not exogenous. In the political process, there is continual give and take between members of the public uh, who come in all sizes and shapes and degrees of influence and information and members of the government who similarly differ in all sorts of ways. And they're interacting, trying to influence one another's beliefs and preferences constantly. And so what happens is the net result 
of all of these forces uh, going one way than the other. On some occasions, clearly, the forces supporting military buildup are dominant, and we get the buildups. On other occasions, the forces opposing buildup are dominant, we get military cutbacks. So uh, we, we do have a relationship here, but it's a, it's a tricky one to interpret. Uh, I did make some efforts uh, in later work to try to, to build more elaborate uh, econometric models to try to capture some of these intricacies, uh, but uh, those were never uh, published or, or reported, and, and indeed they never proved very satisfying to me either in trying to make sense of them. Uh, it's just a complex situation, so I think there's a, a limit, at least to my powers, to to pull it all into some tidy picture. Well, let me stop at this point. Uh, we've got uh, quite a bit of time left in the session for questions and comments. Yeah, Bob? Um, did the Soviet Union have an analog to the MIC, or was their system so different that it wasn't really common? No, they had very much uh, uh, an uh, analog, uh, and in some ways, that's what the Soviet government was. It was just the MIC ran the place. Uh, we tend to look at it and say it's a planned economy, uh, but uh, the Soviet Union was, above all else for its entire existence, just a big military organization. And in fact, uh, it, when we think of, uh, we all know it was a failure in many ways, but, but in the ways that we can identify it, 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 it's having succeeded, they all turn out to be just technical military ways. Uh, defeating the Nazis in World War II. That's just a military undertaking. Uh, developing ICBMs and big rockets and all that, that's just a military task. So, so the only things the Soviets ever, ever had to show for themselves that were, were genuine accomplishments were military. And they, they put all of their best resources, their scientists, their engineers, uh, their educated people, uh, all were focused on uh, the MIC over there. They don't have a Congress muddying the water, of course, but they have a, a military and an industrial side uh, working together and a party apparatus, which in a, for them was kind of serving the same purpose as our executive and uh, Congress over here. Can I Brad? something just about that you yes. said about the Soviets? Uh, I just read um, Andre Kravchenko's book, um, I chose freedom as the name of it. He was one of the first Soviets to um, defect, and he defected right after the war. And he makes the claim in his book that um, that in fact it wasn't the Russian military machine that defeated the Nazis; that it was the German military machine that defeated the Nazis because Germans came so far into Russia and they were surrounded, and the Russians captured tons of German armaments, and they used. German armaments to defeat the Germans. So he claims that their war machine was, was a disaster, that they didn't have any of the materials, the raw materials, the metals, or anything to make any arms or anything, so that they had to use the German armaments to defeat their to defeat them. So that didn't even That's work. true to some extent, but they did produce tons yeah, of tanks. They, they got the bulk of the punch from their own making. I mean, that obviously helped them, that they were able to snatch so much German equipment at uh, Stalingrad, but, uh, but they, they shed the blood, and you know they won the Battle of Stalingrad. That's how they got that stuff to begin with, so they, they deserve some credit. They, they, they paid a hell of a price at Stalingrad. Brad? Um, I'll have a question for you, but just real quick for Bob. Um, you're in Malta, not in the cost of war books, but in the cost of war tapes. He has to talk about the Russian military industrial complex and how it was the Russian economy. Um, but it's hard to get, you know, when you've worked in the, in the MIC and you, it's hard to get uh, your mind around this monstrous organization, and especially since they try to sort of mimic the market. Um, but at one point, you know, far enough back in the stages of production, they do have to face prices somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I mean, in World War II, they could just, and other times they can just confiscate right. things. Yeah. But way back, at some point, they have to face prices. They have to entice people through incomes to join. They have mm -hmm. to buy raw materials. Right. Um, 
And after that, though, would you say it's true that they really don't? I mean, I would think that after that point where they initially buy their raw materials from people who could sell it to other mm-hmm. uh, to private interests just as well. After that, there is no economic calculation. It's all that they yeah. may try to <clears throat> copy things. But. Well, uh, yeah, the, the 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 arms manufacturers have to to pay for their uh, materials and the people they hire, of course, and they they are in competition with with market actors in doing that, but they still don't have to pass a market test in the same way that market firms do, because let's suppose that uh, they go out and they they conduct their business and and they lose money. Now, if you do that uh, for some time running in the market, you're just going to have to go bankrupt. Uh, Your creditors will ensure that. But uh, in the case of the big uh, military contractors, uh, it's almost certain that you won't actually be allowed to go bankrupt because you'll be bailed out. Uh, And you can be bailed out in a number of different ways. You can be bailed out directly. The Defense Department can just give you additional money. And there are any number of accounting entries that can be done under uh, they are constantly readjusting contracts, and so you can do it in the guise of engineering changes. You can do it in, in the guise of adjusting for for earlier failures to uh, to anticipate full costs of production. There are any number of names you can give it, uh, uh, or one of the ways that was frequently used uh, in the Cold War is that that uh, a company's floundering and it's, it's on the verge of going broke, well, give it a brand new contract to do something and shower it with a lot of advanced payments. So that puts it in a flush condition again, and it's off and running. So the bailout uh, guarantee uh, was absolutely critical uh, in the operation of these firms. At one time or another, they all got bailed out. Uh, Lockheed, Martin Marietta, uh, they all got bailouts in, in a big way at, at, at some point, and many of them got repeated bailouts. So, so they're, they're in the market, to be sure, and they, they have to make payments to market actors in order to acquire resources, but they don't have to, to meet a bottom-line test in the same way that a uh, commercial firm must. Yes, sir? Um, I've heard people make statements that, like, uh, the Cold War resulted in the, in the technology boom because of the competitive nature right. that existed between capitalism and socialism. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've heard criticism of this saying that uh, you can't compare that to the, the the existence that didn't exist in two capitalist structures where they compete and right. support one another. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a, a lot of people have argued that there were there were technological gains as a result of the Cold War because they did actually put a great deal of money into research and development, and they developed a lot of new things. Uh, now, uh, almost all of them, of course, are are designed for military applications. Now, what people argue is that even though designed for military applications, they could be adapted to civilian uses, and therefore they had value as new innovations in civilian application. And you can find plenty of examples like that. You know, After all, they spent hundreds of billions of dollars. They're bound to create something at some point uh, that, ha- that, that has enough flexibility to be useful in other areas. Uh, they, they designed... Uh, for example, the the first successful jet airliner, the set Boeing 707, was actually designed as a tanker. And they pretty much just took the tanks out and put seats in, and that was the 707. <laughs> and uh, they developed various techniques and materials, and, uh, and you can accumulate a gigantic uh, list of examples. But again, the question is, this is what we see what is unseen? Uh, if we hadn't been using resources in these purposes, uh, what might we have produced with those same funds, those same resources, uh, aimed directly at producing something beneficial to the civilian economy? And, and just as a general principle, it makes sense to suppose that if you, if you directly try to produce useful 
uh, profitable commercial items. You'll get there quicker than if you rely on, on producing such things by accident while working on military projects. So I, I, I think the, the argument has always been used as a, a, a kind of uh, propaganda uh, to suggest that we don't have to worry that we're squandering resources when we use them on the military because it has all these great spillovers. Uh, I, I, I think the value of those spillovers is vastly overrated, and, and it's a bad argument anyhow because it neglects opportunity cost. Yes, sir. Plus, all those engineers are being used to make more things instead of civilians. Sure, they're one of the most important resources that we're using here. Uh, throughout the Cold War, a big uh, fraction of all American scientists and engineers were engaged in the MIC. Uh, in some cases, if you look at, uh, say, physicists, a majority of them, a big majority of them, were working in the military. Uh, and uh, whenever there's a big military cutback, and we'd find these highly skilled scientists and engineers you know, being thrown in sometimes into work that seemed way below their level of training and preparation, and often was, but, but you know, there's not that much demand for physicists outside the world of military uh, R&D. A big percentage of like, college students in America who are, who are in engineering and science who are not of um, foreign descent are in ROTC. Yeah. Big percentage. I can, I can understand that. I mean, you go to the physics department or engineering department, you see a lot of uh, foreign students, most now, but the ones who are Americans, right. a lot of them are Americans. Right. Yes, sir. Also, the prices of things, uh, you can see how they've been really manipulated around. Like when Chrysler was bankrupt, they mm -hmm. had a contract for a thousand, uh, maybe it was eight months, yeah. and a million dollars each. Yeah. And within three years, they was doing all kinds of funny things. It was the same thousand, but now it's three million dollars right. each. Yeah, or that's right. The airplane we had it was cost cost us three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Thanks to the airplane. Next thing you know, it's uh, like it's being replaced by a, a one million dollar airplane for three hundred fifty thousand. Sure. One million. Yeah. And it was eight million, and then it was. I think within just something like twenty years, it had gone from the three hundred forty thousand dollar thing to yeah twenty five million. One of the uh, places where you always see that kind of huge run-up in unit costs uh, is when uh, they have a stretch out. Uh, normally when they plan these uh, weapons programs, they'll, they'll plan to produce a certain number of units over a certain number of years. And uh, then if a, uh, Congress in its wisdom gets involved and, and sees the end of the production run looming <laughs> and the closure of the plant there in, uh, there in Long Island, uh, they, they, they may micromanage the defense budget to provide that, uh, that Grumman should pr produce uh, another 12 A7s this year. I, I know about that airplane in particular because I, I studied it for an article I wrote. <laughs> and so they're, they're, they, they go on producing a handful of items on a production line really designed to produce dozens or even hundreds of units a year. So they've got a lot of fixed costs that they're bearing as they continue producing, but very few units being produced. So just to cover their costs, they have to charge a lot per unit. And so uh, the Navy, in that instance, ends up paying three times more for each airplane than it was paying uh, two years ago. And uh, and this, this is just another aspect of the waste that Congress injects into what is already a wasteful process. Very well. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>